yeah, I'll be starting off already. Uh, if you guys are ready, just uh, raise your hand. I'll be starting off with the seminar right now. If, uh, like I said before, um, if you have any any question, uh, you can just uh, call it out in the middle of the session. I'll stop and try to answer it. But if you, um, right after the session, we're going to have a Q&A together where we are going to discuss and interact with each other. Uh, so don't worry if uh, your question doesn't get answered in the middle of the sessions, okay? So, uh, first of all, I want to welcome you, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, in this seminar, we'll be talking about flow state and how to achieve it consistently. So the concepts that I'm going to talk about first in this seminar is uh, where did flow originate it? What's the science behind it? And where did it all start it? Uh, I want to talk about after that the changes that it produces in the brain, the four stages of flow, how to trigger flow, and after talking about that, then we'll head up to the Q and A. So, actually, before uh, starting off with the explanation about flow, I want to introduce myself. My name is Blink. Uh, I'm a League of Legends Diamond uh, coach on EU West. Um, I've been coaching League for around three years now. But I've been coaching in Gamer Sensei for yeah for almost two years, and as a coach, I've always focused on applying neuroscience and psychology with my students. I think that having an understanding of the brain and how it works can give you great insight on your mental patterns and your habits as a player. Um, apart from mentality, which is a, a pretty big factor in in League of Legends or any competitive game that you are playing. Um, Neuroscience has taught me other things like, for example, mental processes like reaction time, autopiloting, muscle memory, and much more. How they work in the brain of players and how to apply this knowledge uh, with my students to actually help them improve at this. Um, for those of you who are interested in this kind of uh, topics uh, regarding neuroscience and sports psychology, I do have a, a YouTube channel that we uh, uh, that I'm going to give you a link after uh, the seminar, um, and um, yeah, where I'll go more in depth about these topics and the science behind it. Um, and right now we have a wait, yeah, we have a question right now from uh, Levente Nadai. Uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, I'm really bad with names. Let me know if that's okay. Um, any particular books that you can recommend about neuroscience and psychology for gaming coaches? Uh, so one second, let me just... Uh, I think I'm spotting up the question correctly. Let me know if you guys can see that on the... Yeah, so uh, psychology topics and books about psychology. So the first one that I'm going to recommend you is Flow from Mihaly Chinsek Mihaly, The Optimal Experience. This is such a good topic, uh, such a good book. Sorry to read about. Um, I can also recommend you uh, Brain: The Story of You. Um, that's another really good topic for understanding neuroscience. For example, with me, I'm not a, a neuroscience or psychology student. I just interested um, in these kind of things. So what I do is I try to find up books that are understandable for the public uh, that don't have such a difficult. Um, uh, terms so yeah th so that you can understand and um, what else can I uh, recommend you La one of the best books that I've read um, is um, Peak from Anders Ericsson this book uh, is more of a sci uh, sports psychology book which uh, centers more around um, how to practice deliberately and how actually top performers get to the top of their own expertise and yeah that's uh, basically it. one of the best books I can recommend you about uh, sports psychology. Um, Lina is asking, where do you find buy those books? So for me, I'm always buying from Amazon most of the time. Um, another, you might actually find those books in your local stores as well. But uh, because I'm living in Spain and I'm, I, I want to read these books in English, I, I do have to buy them from Amazon. So. Uh, you can just uh, search them up, or I can give you guys some the names of them, uh, so you guys can um, check them out. Uh, give me guys one second. I'm gonna check out my library. I, I have a few books I can maybe show you. One second. Okay, so these are the two books that I want to talk about. This is Brain: The Story of uh, of You from David Eagleman. This is the I think one of the best books to understand how the brain works. 
if you don't have any neuroscience or psychology background. Then the other one that I recommend for sports psychology is PIC, the optimal secrets from the new science of expertise, sorry, from Anders Ericsson. This is really good for actually for coaches is really good because then you can apply all of the knowledge from that book into, uh, into coaching. So yeah, okay, it's on. Yeah, so if you guys want to, uh, you can join on the on this podium if you wanna ask any questions. Hi there. Oh, hello, I, I see you there, uh, Hi. Levent. How yeah, is it yeah. going? The pronunciation was good. Levent. Oh, is it good? Yeah, yeah. Um, just two books I want to add, uh, mm -hmm. just quickly. Uh, the one is the, um, what was it? Sorry about that. Uh, Talent is Overrated. Uh, this is a really good book for coaches. I have been coaching Overwatch for three years now. Um, and this is, I agree with you on the neuroscience and its uh, psychology that we can apply a lot of it uh, to several, um, on several levels, so to say. So Talent is Overrated is a book um, that I, I really like. It's about how to nurture talent. Uh, or rather that talent is not really an existing thing, but something that yeah. you can develop over time and by putting in a lot of hours. And there are a lot of great stu um, uh, studies and research in this one. The other one is Blink. I didn't uh, got to it, but yet, but... Um, ah, you mean Blink? Uh, I Blink. think you know what book you meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I know that book. Uh, uh, it from... was recommended for me, uh, for, the, for the coaching and for uh, uh, the... Uh, enhancing it uh, a little bit by uh, a little bit of additional knowledge. And mm -hmm. um, I heard that it is a great read. So just to add those. Yeah, actually really good choice though. I like the one that you mentioned from Talent. I haven't read it myself, um, but I, I agree on it uh, quite a lot because um, from because I read a lot of uh, studies and papers from Anders Ericsson. He's one of the, I think, one of the best experienced um, authors you can ask right now uh, for human performance peak yeah. performance and anything. And he actually has a lot of studies uh, backing the the idea up that the uh, talent is not actually not something you are born with, but it's actually something which comes down to three basic principles, which is actually uh, top performers are on the top because one, they've practiced deliberately, they have more practice hours than the rest, two, they have better mental representations, and three, their brain uh, brains are wired towards what they are practicing because they started sooner than average players or average people. And nothing actually is, uh, for example, like uh, a really good example would be Mozart, for example. A lot of people credit him for being born with this talent when in fact it was his father that uh, trained him since he was uh, almost like two or three years old. And he was a composer. He already knew everything that he had uh, to teach to him. So... That's one of the reasons, if not the reason, why Mozart became so good at music, not uh, because he was born with uh, something. Yeah, that's one of the examples in the book, actually. Wow, that's so... Yeah, so I, I think that a lot of these researchers agree on or find common ground on this uh, because it's actually... All, all of the myths are always the same in this, yeah. uh, in this regard, so... All right. Thank you for the opportunity. And just... It was great having you, man. So I'll keep <laughs> continuing with the session then. All right, guys, so, okay, so I'm going to disable the podium. Uh, if for any moment anyone wants to join, just shoot me a, a private message. I'm going to read it through. All right, so starting off with flow, you already might know what it means, uh, flow state. But if you, for some reason, don't know exactly what flow state means, a uh, common, no, uh, common name that a lot of people always give it is being in the zone um which is really talked about in in other sports basically flow <clears throat> is a mental state where we feel and we perform our best uh examples of flow state can be fall, uh, found almost in any field uh for example a musician trying to nail a really difficult solo a basketball player outperforming everyone when there's only seconds left or for example a painter getting so immersed in his work that nothing else will distract, uh, distract him until he finishes his painting. So, so you can see there's a lot of uh, examples of flow states. It's not something specific for any field. It's something you can achieve um, on any field. Um, yeah, basically flow, it's uh, everywhere and it's achievable by everyone. It doesn't matter how old you are, what game are you playing or what is your current rank, you can achieve flow. 
And that's what we're going to focus on on this uh, session, how we're going to, I'm going to teach you guys how to achieve flow um, through uh, having an understanding of how it works in the brain. One of the things that flow does uh, in the brain is increased performance. Another thing that you also might know commonly on flow is that we feel our best. Um, this is mainly because the a uh, lot of neurochemicals are being deposited in your uh, in your system while you're in flow state. And the third feat about flow state is increased learning and memory retention. Um, I'm going to talk about later on why this is the case, but uh, just bear with me uh, for now. Then um, I'm going to talk about a few other cases of flow state uh, that you probably will have heard about if you are into this thing. So for example, DARPA, which is the develop, um, the team that's the responsible for the development of advanced technologies for the US military, yeah, uh, they actually conducted a, st uh, a study and they found that the, time, that the time that takes a novice sniper to get to an expert level marksman was actually cut in half when being under the state of flow. Um, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty big uh, feat to actually cut in half all the time that takes a novice sniper, especially in the military. Uh, for example, another ex uh, another example, if McKinsey and company, if you guys know that company, conducted a 10-year study of top executives, and they found that the top executives that were in flow were five times more productive than their peers who were just working normally. Um, if you aren't aware of this, uh, five times more productive means actually a 500% increase. Um, so for an employee, that means that you can go to work on Monday spend all Monday in flow state, take Tuesday to Friday off and get as much done as what your peers uh, as, as what your peers would have achieved from Monday to Friday just working normally. So basically flow state is such a huge boost in performance um, that I think so everyone should be uh, learning about this topic and applying it. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, where flow or originated and, and how it all began. So Flow science actually dates back to around 150 years ago in the early 1870s. Uh, if you guys know William James, famous psychologist and philosopher, considered for, for many actually the father of psychology, was the first one to figure out that the brain can alter consciousness and improve performance. Um, but yes, it wasn't actually until the 1960s and the early 1970s that flow was actually beginning to get more attention. Actually, uh, the term flow was coined, like I said before, if you guys were before here in the session, was coined in 1975 by Mihail Chinsek Mihai. Uh, a little bit difficult on the pronunciation. Um, so yeah, Mihail Chinsek Mihai actually uh, is the first one that conducted one of the largest psychological studies known to date. He actually went around the world to interview expert performers, top athletes, musicians, mathematicians, and many more. And basically, they, they all said the same, that when they were in this state of flow, they failed their best and they performed their best. So uh, I talked about it before, but uh, Chinsek Mihai, uh, Chin Mihai called this state flow because everyone that he interviewed said that when they were in this state, they performed their best, they pushed to their limits, but it felt, it felt effortlessly. Uh, like if every action and every decision led fluidly to the next one. Um, in other words, uh, flow felt flowy, basically. So that's why he came up with the name. Um, now, what does flow actually do for performance, apart um, from actually making us feel good while, we, while we're in the state? So flow amplifies basically all of our physical and mental skills. So this is basically we're faster, we're better, we're stronger, we make faster decisions, we, uh, our information uh, processing speed goes up, uh, we process the information more deeply or pattern recognition actually improves our predictions improve like uh, it's basically an amp up to or a jack up to everything that we do uh, we basically get into what a lot of students actually called <laughs> ultra instinct if you've ever watched dragon ball it's really funny that i a lot of students actually call it this way um, but when we get into flow a certain type of changes happen in the brain in order to understand flow, we must actually uh, understand what happens inside of, of the brain. So there are three types of changes that occur uh, when we're uh, in flow state, okay? So we have neuroanatomy changes, which is basically changes in the anatomy of the brain, neuroelectricity changes, which is basically changes to the brain waves of the brain, and neurochemistry changes, which is basically uh, a change in the chemistry of the brain, hormones, 
neurotransmitters, that kind of stuff. So I have a quick question from Ibrahim. Let me go really quick. So uh, if the flow state is so good, then why wouldn't it be uh, a more common experience? Um, okay. Oh, hi, Steph. Hey. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, since it's so good, what, how is it not more easily achievable? So pro players or people who try to practice it just have it be a much more common experience for them. Yeah, so if you've noticed, it just so happens that pro players and top athletes are the ones that achieve it. So that's one reason why you can see the correlation between actually flow state and peak performance. Um, so what I think is that the average player, why it's not able to achieve it so often is because it, they have like this lack of understanding of how the brain works. Um, that's why I, I like to cover this concept a lot with students, because once they know how this state is achievable, and how to achieve it more uh, often, that's when their performance starts to skyrocket, basically. When understanding this concept of flow, how it works in the brain, how to achieve it, is when we can um, get it more often. Uh, I, I guess it's just the uh, missing information of people that they don't know how to actually, for example, people that don't meditate, that don't have any uh, awareness of how, how their brain works. Um, is basically the same people that don't achieve flow state because they don't get through the first phase of the flow state, which I'm going to cover next, which is the struggle phase, basically. Um, like the brain is overloaded with a, a lot of information or you are in the middle of a problem. Um, and because you don't have that uh, knowledge of how the brain works, you're basically stuck into this first uh, phase of, uh, of struggle and you're not able to go to the next phase, which is all, uh, all actually called release phase that I'm gonna talk about right now in the in this session. I look forward to hearing about it. Yeah, we're gonna get into it really soon, don't worry. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna keep going. I, I hope that answered your, or your question, uh, Ibrahim. Um, if not, just shoot me up another question uh, whenever you guys want. Um, so yeah, what Ibrahim was saying that is uh, basically like I said, why are we not achieving flow state, everyone, uh, all the time, right? Um, apart from what I said of the people not knowing how to get into the uh, release phase, there's also another reason why you cannot get into flow all the day, um, which is basically because uh, there's a fourth, a fourth stage called uh, recovery phase. Basically, imagine your brain that has to produce this state. I'm going to get into it really, really soon. But when you get into flow, a lot of neurochemicals are produced into your brain. And those are really potent neurochemicals. Um, so you your body, basically, after finishing with the flow state, it has to replenish those neurochemicals and get into what I call the, well, what it's called from, from the flow, uh, flow science, the recovery phase. Um, so yeah, just uh, keep continuing on the, on the changes that we experience during flow. We have the, like I said, neuroanatomy, neuroelectricity, and neurochemistry. So there was, if you guys know, probably there was this old, old idea that we only use 10% of our brain in normal state of operation, right? It's actually a pretty common myth. There was this uh, idea of that we only use 10% of our brain. So flow state must mean that we use 100% of our brain, right? Or at least a higher percentage. Well, it turns out they actually had it uh, exactly backwards. Um, the research actually shows that, uh, look, uh, through a lot of brain scans, that when we get into flow state, our brain actually starts to deactivate. Um, so now why, why does this happen? The main reason is because it's an efficiency exchange. See, the brain consumes a lot of energy. It's only 2% of our body mass, but it consumes 20% of our energy. So the fundamental rule of the brain is always, how can I conserve more energy? Um, so for example, conscious processing uh, is very slow. It's extremely energy expensive. While on the other hand, subconscious processing is very fast and very, very energy efficient. So what happens during flow is that we are trading conscious processing for subconscious processing. And as this happens, we experience uh, the changes in neuroanatomy, the ones that I'm gonna mention now. Oh, the first change, in, well, the actual change that you experience on neuroanatomy is transient hypofrontality. This basically, well, it's just a fancy way, uh, fancy way to say that our prefrontal cortex, which is this part of the brain, uh, is temporarily shut down during flow state. Uh, specifically, our dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for planning complex cognitive behavior, personality expression, uh, decision making, and social behavior. 
basically is that inner critical voice that you hear all the time that likes to judge everything you do. That voice is shut down during flow. Um, during normal state of operation, you of course need this uh, working because uh, you want to make good decisions. You don't want to walk into the road and get hit by a car. But during flow, actually that little voice that likes to judge like everything that you do, for example, like, oh, I'm walking too fast or I look ridiculous with these clothes or whatever, that voice is shut down during flow. That's one of the first changes that you experience. Um, and it's actually, um, let's see if I can show you guys the files. Um, I don't, I don't have them yet. Um, but if I, if I get the files, uh, I'm going to show you guys the fMRIs that I'm talking about, which they show the, um, the activation of the brain during flow state. So basically all your, all your conscious processes go, go deactivate, uh, they deactivate and your subconscious mind takes over, which is faster and less energy, uh, if, um, and more energy efficient. Sorry. One second. I have, yeah, we have a question. So. Is there a downside to, this is asked by Andrei Fedorov. Um, let me know if I pronounce correctly. Um, is there a downside to flow state? For example, having a hard time to pick up and backtrack on mistakes or focus vision instead of broad vision. Okay, yeah, so the only downside I would see from flow state is if you're trying to make a long-term decision, basically trying to come up with a decision uh, for your, uh, for example, should I, buy this car or something like that. That's not something you want to do in flow state, for example, um, because you need your prefrontal cortex for that. But uh, in any sport or any um, a skill that you need flow state for, I would say definitely has no down downsides, I think, um, because you're better off uh, going off with your subconscious processing than your conscious processing, because uh, a lot of people ha get anxious or have a lot of doubts in, the in themselves when they're processing with uh, their prefrontal cortex, but when it's with their subconscious, um, it's basically you're going off with uh, your previous experiences on on the same situations that you're experiencing. So of course, you're going to take decisions way, way faster with your subconscious. So I, I think it's uh, actually way better to always be in flow state for performing, um, even in math, actually. Uh, there's this day, uh, the study on math that they gave arithmetic task to individuals. And when they were in the normal state of operation, they couldn't uh, solve them. But when they were uh, on flow state, they actually had uh, a, a big improvement. Let me sh see if I can uh, show you guys the, I think this is the study. But yeah, as you can see guys, uh, <laughs> I have to turn around my head, but as you can see, the prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex and amygdala are deactivated during flow state. And this actually, this fMRI is from the study that I'm talking about uh, that people, the, the researchers gave arithmetic tasks to the individuals and being in prefrontal cortex, like in normal state of operation, they couldn't solve it. But being in flow state, uh, they, they actually solved it. Um, there was a big, big uh, improvement. So uh, another thing that actually happens uh, during flow is that the, the time passes strangely. Uh, you see a lot of the... Um, people that experience flow, like for example, you might look at it like in a car crash. Um, people always report that this uh, experience always had like a frame freeze effect, uh, like the time slowed down. Or for example, time can dilate in the other way. And for example, five hours can just uh, feel like they've passed in five minutes. So that's another reason, uh, another thing that happens during flow. And if you guys guess, it's because the prefrontal cortex uh, is shut down, like we talked before. And that's actually where time regulation happens in your brain. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, neuroelectricity and the brain waves. Uh, this is the changes that occur to the neuroelectricity part of the brain. Um, so as you guys know or don't, um, brain waves are basically synchronized electrical pulses from masses of neurons communicating with each other. So basically uh, there are only five, well, there are more, but the five key brain waves are gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Um, so we normally operate in beta waves, which are fast moving waves. Um, flow actually happens uh, during alpha and theta. So alpha is actually the brain wave uh, you are in before sleeping, uh, as well as theta, uh, which is actually, well, theta is actually only achievable in the hypnagogic state. Hypnagogic state is basically 
as as you're about to fall asleep, basically, that, that little seconds. Um, so being in theta actually can trigger gamma spikes. Um, gamma spikes are responsible for the aha moment. For example, you connect different ideas in your in your brain, and then you're like, aha, I got that idea. That's basically a gamma spike in your brain. Um, so yeah, this is why also creativity skyrockets during flow, uh, because your, your pattern recognition and your lateral thinking, lateral thinking means to connect different ideas or ideas from this, uh, different parts of the brain, uh, goes up. So this is uh, a way to boost creativity uh, as well. Uh, the third type of change that occurs on the brain when we are in flow state is on neurochemistry, basically on the neurochemistry of the brain. So five of the most potent neurochemicals are released into your brain. Uh, I'm gonna list them here. It's neuropinephrine, which is a focused neurochemical, which produce, uh, promotes vigilance and alertness and enhances formation and retrieval of memory. Dopamine uh, is also produced in during flow state, which actually boosts motivation and drive and also lowers distractions. Um, another really good um, chemical is anandamide, which reduces an anxiety, boosts lateral thinking, and also improves pattern recognition. Another one, serotonin, a calming neurochemical that keeps us in alpha and theta brainwaves, and endorphins, which is a really potent uh, painkiller, if you know about endorphins, and also produce a feeling of euphoria. Uh, because these chemicals are so addictive, uh, well, they're so potent that this is this state is all, all, all also really addictive, or as scientists like to call it, autotelic, which basically means that it ends in itself. Um, basically, it means that one, once you get into the state, you, you will want more of it, basically. So that's why it feels so good. Um, one thing that happens uh, during flow state, because you have all of these neurochemicals in your brain, this will actually boost your memory retention. This is why DARPA actually managed to uh, help uh, novice snipers learn faster during flow, because um, the brain chooses which memories to retain and which not, um, based on the neurochemicals that you have in your brain uh, during that uh, learning. Uh, process. So for example, if you have a really intense experience, like for example, a car crash or something, you will remember most likely all of the events of the car crash if nothing nothing happened to your brain. Because during that state of the car crash, you were actually with all of the uh, neurochemicals in your brain. So your brain categorizes that moment that's really important. That's why um, intense moments like this are stored uh, in your memory better than, for example, what you ate last uh, last uh, night, for example. Now, uh, I'll talk about the four stages of flow, uh, but before going it, uh, going with it, I wanna ask you guys if you have any questions regarding the, uh, the, the, the changes that it produces in the brain. So just let me shoot, shoot your questions uh, in the question mark uh, icon, and I'll try to answer them on the go. So Caesar asks, uh, can I have the podium? Yes, of course, let me spotlight you. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you explaining this and uh, everything. I started to read the book actually, uh, of, uh, the optimal experience of uh -huh. uh, So my question regarding uh, is, uh, you mentioned that uh, the pref uh, the prefrontal cortex gets uh, deactivated while in the float state. And uh, based on the study that you have uh, showed us, it was uh, a study based on, uh, like, they gave arithmetic uh, problems to the yes. test subjects, right? Exactly, but, yes. But uh, within the arith arithmetic problems, uh, there is no decision making needed, while mm -hmm. the prefrontal -front cortex is really needed in the decision making process, like uh, in gaming. It's uh, it's pretty much the, the most important thing is the decision making, whether it's League of Legends, StarCraft, or anything. Yeah. So, uh, so we need uh, like, uh, and uh, even the snipers or the military or we need to do the decision making in a, a very short of time, like uh, accurate decision making within split uh, seconds. And who who has the better decision making and the faster decision making? He, he, he is the one who will get an advantage. So deactivating the prefrontal cortex, I think maybe this study is uh, like not very accurate within this uh, subject or I, um, I have my doubts in that. Uh, yeah, like it's a, 
Yeah, exactly. Like it's a conclusion I came up with uh, as well. I was thinking, wait, why is the deactivating the prefrontal cortex? Um, but it's actually not all the prefrontal cortex that uh, it's the it's activating. It's uh, exactly the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, the one that's actually fully deactivated. Um, that one is uh, one piece of the puzzle. Like the brain is really complex. Like even though the prefrontal cortex is based for is there for decisions, um, it's not only that thing in the puzzle. There's way more other things. Um, but in flow, during flow, the part exactly that deactivates, or at least that's what I, I, I've been reading about in the flow research, is the dor dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So that's that's the, actually the the critical voice that I talked about before. So it's not like your decision making is um, is impaired during flow. It's just that your conscious uh, processing is deactivated. So you can still take decisions. And you will, of course, you need to take decisions, but it's basically uh, done in a subconscious manner, basically really fluidly, uh, so that to say. I don't okay. know if that uh, that answers yeah, your, your question. I understand, thank you very much. Thank you for coming up. So uh, I have another question here from Matthew that plays League of Legends. Uh, does verbalizing thoughts uh, in my head or having reactions to mistakes like frustrating, stop me from entering flow. Uh, sorry, one second, let me read through again. Oh, so you mean that that's verbalizing thoughts in your head or for example, having uh, frustrating thoughts uh, stop you from entering flow. Actually, it could actually stop you from entering flow if you don't know how to go from the struggle phase to the release phase. So that's the problem <clears throat> that I was talking about in the beginning. A lot of players actually stick in the struggle phase, they don't know how to go from struggle to release to flow, and they get stuck into this um, constant uh, stage of uh, cycle of repeating themselves. Oh, this is bad. I made this mistake. And they consciously repeat it all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm about to actually talk about the four stages of flow. But just as a, as a quick uh, answer to your questions, uh, it will impair you most of the time, yes. So you should be uh, trying to um calm down that voice by meditating if you have experienced meditation you know how to um basically let go of the problem and focus on another thing um but yeah i'm about to get into into that right now with uh with the four stages of flow so as you guys can tell the first the first stage of flow is the struggle phase which is basically when we are facing a difficult problem our cortisol levels in this days, uh, stage is really high, and we are high in beta waves. As you know before, they're fast moving waves. So we're really far away from flow state. Um, after uh, struggle phase, then there is the release phase, basically when we let go of the problem and we calm ourselves. Basically what happens during this stage is that a global release of nitric oxide, which is another chemical that, or another hormone that uh, flashes all the stressful uh, um, hormones in your system um, uh, is flushed out in your body, basically. So nitric oxide, really important to, to flush out all of the stress hormones. And then after the release phase is the flow stage, uh, flow stage is, itself, uh, where we feel and we perform our best. Um, after the flow state um, is the recovery phase uh, where, for example, all the neurochemicals that have been released during flow uh, have been drained from your brain and now your uh, body needs some time to replenish them. So this is why you cannot go into flow state forever. At some point, you will need to stop and replenish those neurochemicals. So first, uh, in the struggle phase, um, if you are not aware or how to actually get off the problem, you're gonna stick into the struggle phase and never get into flow. This is the, the problem we're talking about right, right before in the question. Um, what happens is that in this, in this stage of uh, on struggle phase, people always feel anxious. They, the cortisol level is really high and during, during this stage and, and, and they never learn the, the actual way to get into, uh, into the release phase. So we, you actually have to learn to let go of the problem and calm yourself and let your subconscious mind take over. So to do so, you can actually um, focus on, if you know, meditation and breathing technique which can basically teach you how to shut down the prefrontal cortex. Well, in specifically the dorsal lateral uh, prefrontal cortex, which is the one responsible for 
uh, for that critical voice that we've just talked about. Um, so yeah, struggle phase really important. You need to get over it. If you don't, if you don't, and you don't let the go, you don't let your mind go of the problem. You will get into that cycle all the time, and you'll never get into flow. Um, then another really uh, underrated uh, stage in the flow state is the recovery stage, uh, which is often really ignored. So we must take the proper rest and let our uh, hormone system replenish the drained neurochemicals. If you don't, uh, then what happens is that you will not be able to experience flow as effectively or it will not last long enough to actually help you achieve a better performance. So really important, two stages are really important, which is the struggle phase and the recovery phase. If you know how to master those two, you know how to master flow state and hack it and being able to achieve it almost any day uh, when you need it. So before going into the next topic, which is gonna be flow triggers, um, I wanna ask you guys if someone has any question. Um, so I wanna answer or someone wants to join the podium, uh, I'll enable the podium if you guys want. If not, just uh, I'll continue. Okay, so Adiata Yosh, uh, Yoshi, sorry if I pronouncing that wrong. Uh, so take breaks as example of recovery phase. I guess you're meaning what what kind of breaks to take to get into recovery phase or or how to improve recovery phase. I'm not sure exactly what do you mean. No. Oh, I hear you now. Oh, okay, okay, sweet. Hi. Hi. So uh, when you meant uh, recovery phase, like for for example, like let's say uh, you're on like a huge winning streak, like five or six games, and let's say uh, you don't want to feel like you want to take a break, you just want to keep winning more. So the better idea to take breaks then, as an example. So depends on if you're in flow state or not. Um, you might be winning games, but you might not be in, in flow state. Um, okay. It could happen. Uh, you could be actually in flow state, for example, if you've seen a lot of the research from from Mihail Chinsek Mihail, he actually interviewed artists that could actually go without food and without uh, sleep and just straight up in flow state for hours and hours straight. Um, so what will happen eventually is that you, you will actually exit flow state and you will need a pretty, pretty big uh, recovery phase after that. So um, it, whether it, that, that will be uh, sleeping, eating, or basically meditating can actually help you recover f uh, faster as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm supposing that for just a few hours, you can actually get into flow state a few times. You don't need to okay. stop at some point during game. You can actually get at a flow state uh, on and on intermittently, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. That okay, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Thank you so much for coming. So. Um, I'll keep going now with the flow triggers, which is basically how to trigger flow, um, what are the triggers to flow, and how to get them. So uh, there are basically 17 flow triggers. I know that sounds like a lot. 17 flow triggers that have been discovered by the Flow Genome Project, which is the um, uh, from Stephen Kotler and Jamie Will, the uh, genome project that uh, they do the research on flow. Um, even though there's 17 flow triggers, we will cover only the four that are psychological triggers because uh, there is psychological trigger, uh, triggers, environmental triggers, social triggers as well, and creative ones. So for us, which is basically the, um, the gaming scene, uh, we only care about the psychological triggers um, because the uh, environmental triggers uh, are not there. We are not uh, in a life-threatening situation while we're playing, so those ones are not gonna work. Um, so psychological triggers, uh, well, first of all, is uh, intensely focused attention, okay? So one of the primary purposes of flow state is to help you focus on the task at hand, right? Um, however, to hack into the flow state in the first place, you must be in a position that allows you to strongly focus your attention to your goals. So this also means like multitasking is out. You flow demands a singular and solitude action, basically. You need to be focused on one task. Um, the second psychological trigger, uh, trigger sorry, is uh, clear goals. 
when you have clear goals, your mind doesn't have to wonder what to do next, uh, what to do next. You know what what you're going to do, why you're doing it, um, and you also don't uh, focus on the finish line. You focus on running the race, for example. Um, the third psychological uh, trigger is immediate feedback. Um, this trigger is partnered with clear goals. Um, basically, clear goals tell us what we're doing, and immediate feedback tell us how we're doing it or how can we do it better. Uh, the fourth uh, um, psychological trigger, which is the most important one, and it's the one that I want you guys to remember. I think it is this one. Please let it be. Oh, no, it's again turned up upside down. Um, but yeah, this one, the challenge and skill, skill ratio chart, developed by Mihail Shinsek Mihai and his team of researchers. So um, the challenge skill ratio trigger, uh, you might hear about it, the concept of a stress curve, for example, where there is a scale of low stress and low performance. And on the other hand, there's high stress and low performance. But in the middle, there is uh, the scale, which is optimal level of stress correlating with peak performance. So the flow challenge skill ratio exists near, but uh, not always in the middle between boredom and anxiety. So if you if you look at the uh, of the chart, you can see what, that when the challenge is low and the skill is low, you have apathy. When the challenge is high um, and the skill is low, for example, you have an anxiety when you don't know exactly uh, what you're doing. Um, and you have a uh, flow state, which is in the middle, which is basically when the uh, skill is high and the challenge is, is also high. The number that a lot of people are using in this, uh, I mean, what uh, Steve uh, Steve Kotler and Mihal Chinsek Mihar are using, using in his uh, research is 4%. So the challenge basically has to be 4% higher than your current skill. Too much of, uh, of challenge and too low of, of skill and you will get an anxiety. So you have to be careful for that. Um, this is the most important uh, psychological trigger uh, trigger to flow state. The basically the, the perceived skills that you have and the challenge that you experience must be on par so to actually get into a flow state. So it's really important to actually um, have that that skill first in the first place. You're not going to get into a flow state if you don't know what you're doing. Basically, that's uh, what what they're, they're trying to say. Yeah, basically understand that to too low of challenge, for example, and you will get boredom. You will not be in in flow if what if you what you're doing is not important to you. Basically, it is not difficult. The other psychological, uh, sorry, the other triggers from flow does not apply to the gaming scene. For example, high stressful situations in real life, like a car crash, you're never gonna get into car crash in real life. So the uh, only triggers that matter are the ones uh, that we've mentioned, which is intensely focused attention, clear goals immediate feedback and challenge skill ratio. And yeah, with that, uh, we conclude the, the flow seminar. Uh, I will be enabling the podium. So if anyone wants to join up to discuss about it, uh, feel free. And, and yeah, or, or shoot me any questions uh, for the, uh, uh, in the questions tab, if you guys want. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear now, Alex. Yeah, yeah, hey. Hello. It's it's Nift, by the way. Um, what is? It's Nift, by the way. Oh, Nift. Hi. How yeah. You? Hey, man. Um, I was gonna ask because you were talking about. I already asked this in the group chat before. Uh, when you were talking about like having like a specific goal, um, and my guess, yeah, that it was going to be kind of a game by game rather than a long term. But let's say that you're not specifically trying to improve at a specific skill, but you're trying to climb. Um, can you kind of cheat the system kind of by making yourself some sort of like little performance goal game by game, like um, do this specific thing or I don't know? Yeah, like I'm assuming the goal is more internal. It's not, it doesn't have to apply to the rules of the game. So you don't necessarily have to choose a goal that it's uh, game specific. We could say, for example, I want to win mid lane. And then if you say that, you will basically do everything that's in your mind uh, in your head to win that um, to win the mid lane that is a clear goal for example i think you can basically cheat it like that if if you focus on it and the challenge and skill ratio is there then you should be able to achieve flow i think awesome yeah thanks you're welcome man thanks for showing up if someone else wants to join
Well, hello again. Uh, I just uh, have a quick question. So regarding yes. the chart that you have shared, uh, so uh, regarding uh, anxiety and the flow state. So in both the situations, the the challenge level is high. So is this, is the challenge level? Is it the actual challenge level, or is it the perceived? Uh, challenge level that we have like what i think that is, is this hard or is this uh, like uh, easy or is it the actual challenge level mm -hmm. yeah i i love that you bring this up because it's actually the what they say always in in the study of uh, flow state they actually talked about perceived uh skill so I, I th what I think they mean is actually, of course, you need some level of uh, of skill in a certain uh, field to actually be able to achieve flow. You need to know what you're doing. Um, but I think that the perceived skills are actually way more important. So, for example, if I if one day I'm feeling like I'm really low level, like everyone is performing better than me, I'm of course not going to be uh, on flow state that day because my perceived skills are really low on that day so they're not gonna get paired up with the amount of uh challenge that i'm putting up with right so to answer your question i think it's actually yeah your your perceived skills that the ones that matter more uh if you already have experience in the field you you want to achieve flow on uh just a little bit uh, like a story time <laughs> i just uh, yeah share, i want to share an experience so uh, I'm currently, I used to play League, I was Platinum and uh, I left the game, I started to play StarCraft. Uh, after playing StarCraft, I'm currently at Diamond 3 level, so it's not really high, but... Uh, it's, well, that's, so, that's way better than me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the last time, like, uh, I I really, uh, like, I was aware that I achieved, I achieved flow state, I, uh, I, uh, I, I matched up with a friend who is a Master 2 player, and... Uh, he is a really uh, like uh, he's a really good player, and we did a really serious match. But mm -hmm. when I went against him, uh, like I didn't want to win. I just wanted to have the experience. So I, it wasn't like I wasn't anxious about it. There was no anxiety, and actually, uh, I won that game. And I really was surprised that I won um, that game. But after uh, looking at the statistics after that game, I was like, uh, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Ultra Instinct. Like uh, I went Super <laughs> Saiyan in that game. Actually, my APM went up from um, my average is what, like 100, 120, went up to 200. And after that uh, match ended and uh, in the following days, I have tried to replicate that and I couldn't. I hmm. really I uh, tried so hard to, to replicate that uh, like performance that I did, but I couldn't. So I think uh, at the same time I went in some tournaments and like uh, streaming and uh, everything. Mm -hmm. I had the anxiety. Uh, I was in the anxiety state and I performed so bad because it was like uh, I was uh, anxious about uh, the stream and the competition and everything. Yeah, like so, it's so. Yeah, it so happens that when you finally get off the problem, like when you let it go, when you shut down your prefrontal cortex, well, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is that critical voice, the anxious feeling, is when you actually let your brain perform. Like, uh, I think that a lot of us have the skills uh, required to actually get to a higher level is that we get in our way ourselves sometimes with this uh, judging, with anxiousness, we're basically hindering our performance doing that. And I think that like what the story that you just told about is makes makes perfect sense, I think, in the flow scenario, because uh, um, what you said, like your perceived skills were no longer part of the equation. You were, weren't focusing on them. You just um, let your subconscious mind take over. And, and yeah, like amazing things can happen. Like you see in, in other fields in, like math uh, and art and sports and everything. So yeah, like it's so amazing to see other players uh, experiencing flow and where they can get, honestly. But my question here is like, how can we achieve that like more constantly? And uh, like, uh, I, I know the, uh, this is what is about that we are talking, but uh, how do we achieve it more constantly? How do we have the like uh, the ability Mm -hmm. the, yeah, to basically uh, hack it and control it more, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, you need to get really good at the two phases that are the ones that I talked about. Like, you need to get really good at struggling and you need to get really good at recovery. So, struggling is a bit tricky. You need, 
a lot of like I would recommend you 100% meditation because meditation what it helps you is it helps you lower distractions so you're basically way more focused you know how to change your attention span to one idea or the other and it also helps you develop emotional control that's really important if you want to get from the struggle phase to the release phase uh, you need to lower your brain waves uh, from high beta to alpha and theta so that you can trigger the flow state um, and then recovery phase often ignored like people don't care about recovery phase they can think that they can just flow state all the way all the day and just flow state flow state no 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 you need to recover better you need to uh, get your sleep get your exercise going and also get your diet on point for um for to replenish those neurochemicals so if you get really good at those uh, two stages i think you can hack flow state and get it way more consistently all right all right guys that that's enough so Thank you so much, guys, for, for coming up to the seminar. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And like I said, um, get really good at these two stages. Um, and also, um, if you guys want to follow me up on any of my social medias or on my YouTube channel where I cover things like neuroscience, like I cover how to improve reaction time, avoid autopiloting, uh, sports psychology topics like deliberate practice, mental representation, stuff like that. Uh, you guys can follow me on uh, youtube.com slash C slash blink underscore YouTube if you guys want to follow me there. Um, I'll enable the podium if you want. If not, yeah, guys, like I said, uh, thank you so much for checking up the seminar. Gamer Sensei is going to be making more seminars uh, like this. So make sure to check them out uh, if you want to stay informed with what they're going to do. And yeah, guys, that's it for me. Um, I'll try to, I'll be around here for a little longer to see if we can set up like a conversation with everyone. Um, but if not, I'll hope to see you around, guys. Thank you so much for checking out the seminar.